À tous les participants qui sont avec nous dans la salle, je rappelle que cette session est interprétée en trois langues, français, anglais, espagnol, et que vous pouvez accéder au français sur le canal 1, à l'anglais sur le canal 2. Et à... This is in, there's interpretation, you've got French on channel 1, uh, English on channel 2, and Spanish on channel 3. Now the session, uh, we have three languages for interpretation in this session. Uh, number one for French, number two for English, and number three for Spanish. Uh, without further ado, I will start uh, now, and I'm very pleased to welcome you here for this session uh, that the International Network of Basin Organization is organizing jointly with IUCN Regional Office for West Asia on cooperation on natural based solutions for adaptation to climate change in the basins of lakes, rivers, and aquifers. Uh, we will have uh, for our uh, introduction and conclusion the intervention of Dr. Eric Tardieu, Director General of the International Office for Water and Secretary General of the International Network of Basin Organization, and Mr. Ali Ayajne, who is Program Manager for Water and Climate at the IUCN ROA. Madame Marie-Christine Huot from Veolia is also, also joining us, and we have online the other speakers that I will introduce later, but without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Ali Ayajne. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edward. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being with us today with this very important session, I think. I'm actually so glad that IUCN Roa and IMBO organized this session where I see it's a very important and great opportunities to have an interactive dialogues, to exchange thoughts, and to show some cases from different regions related to the nature-based solution for adopting climate change. <clears throat> Actually, I want to emphasize in some points related to the nature-based solutions and how we see nature-based solution as an approach from our experience, talking about our experience in Middle East, our uh, MENA region in general. <clears throat> We all agree and know the potential benefits for nature-based solutions, for securing and managing the water resources at different level, even at surface water level, groundwater aquifers, and also for having the power to have and adapt and build resilience for climate change. But the question is, do we measure the effectiveness of the nature-based solution interventions? Do we have the proof to convince the people, the decision makers, about the effectiveness of these uh, solutions? I see nature-based solution, it's not an action for protect and restore ecosystem as defined by IUCN and other international organizations. I see it, and I do believe that nature-based solution is a fundamental and sustainable strategy that have the power to have a better and strong adaptation tools and building resilience at all levels. Another things and another questions, do we have the enabling environment? Do we have the enabling condition to have a successful, successfully implemented nature-based solution strategy? What about the politicians? What about the decision makers? Decision makers and politicians always look for fast and effective solutions, regardless if it's sustainable or not. How we can prove to them that nature-based solution can and could have a very strong solution through our nature. I think we have first looking about how to engage the local communities and the beneficiaries and the right holders for the nature-based solutions. With, without engaging them, I think we never could reach the point that to tackle the social challenges, which is one of the main pillars of the nature-based solutions. So engaging the local communities and secure them and involve them in all 
the process of nature-based solution. They have the traditional knowledge on the ground. They know how to prioritize their challenges. So having them and involve them in a strong way will assure that we can uh, achieve our targets and get our, uh, let's say, anticipated result from nature-based solutions. Another key issue, actually, the nature-based solution standards. Without standards, we cannot guarantee that our intervention in the ground is aligned with the ecosystem restoration and the protections. We have to have standards with the clear criteria, with the clear indicators. And actually, IUCN did excellent and a great job, and they're producing the nature-based solutions. But as, as all of you know, no one size fits all. So we have to customize these standards and, and use it based on the level that you are targeting and the region you are working with. The last point that I want to emphasize also on, and then I will leave the floor to my colleagues, and for sure they will shed a light on all these points, is that how we can prove, again, that our interventions in the ground is successfully achieved. We have to have a monitoring and evaluation process. And to have a robust plan for monitoring and evaluation, you have to start with assessing the current status of ecosystem that you are planning to interfere in. We have to have a baseline, we have to have a benchmark for the current status that we have want to use the nature to solve our problems if it's in water or a climate change. So the last point, I think now it's a time that not only to read and to talk and have these solutions in the paper, we have to act more to move from theory to practice. We have to put a lot of efforts to, to improve, uh, to prove that, that for the decision makers that the sustainable, the nature-based solution and the nature has, to, has the power to adapt and to build the resilience for all, uh, for all local communities at all different uh, levels. Uh, I will leave it to you, uh, Edward, thank you. Merci, merci Ali. Et nous partageons. And of course, we're going to be sharing the, to the organization all of the points that have just been brought up by IUCN for the need for a definition for standards as well, but also moving, putting it into practice, as you've just said, Ali, and of course, we very much share in that idea how to implement and in a cooperative way this, these nature-based solutions. We'll be talking about that together now with our main speaker uh, about the trans-border aspect. I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Robert White Desoisy, the Executive Director of the Volta uh, Basin Authority, to talk about solutions, uh, so nature-based solutions as an adaptation tool. We've seen that they are often promoted as a solution to fight against droughts and floods. And Mr. Desoisy, I would like to give you the floor to ask you how, on this cross-border level, we can use nature-based solutions and how they are actually implemented for the, uh, for the nature, uh, res natural resources. Merci, mesdames et messieurs. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have been asked to we have been asked to share with you our experience uh, in the field of uh, the designing and implementation of nature-based solutions for the purposes of managing climate change. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of cooperative management in the basin of the river Volta in Africa. The uh, Volta Basin is, uh, well, the, the Volta River is 1,850 kilometers long, covers a total area of 400,000 ki square kilometers, spanning six countries, namely the Benin, Benin, Burkina Faso, Côte d'Ivoire, Mali, Ghana, and Togo. 
these six countries came together after nearly four years of talks. On the 19th of January 2007, these six countries came together to set up the Volta Basin Authority. This is something that they had discussed at some length. In particular, under Article 2 of this agreement for the Volta Basin Authority, the six states declared that the River Volta, its tributaries and sub-tributaries, to be an international river and undertook to cooperate closely with a view to the reasonable and sustainable management of the Volta's water resources. In doing so, this agreement mandates the Volta Basin Authority to promote ongoing consultation and sustainable development with a view to equitably sharing earnings in order to reduce poverty and enhance social and economic development. What are the main challenges facing our Volta Basin? Well, the Volta Basin, like um, other African river basins, has been, since the 1970s, affected by the combined effects of climate change and ever-increasing demographics. And these combined effects have led to a reduction of our natural resources with potential or underlying conflicts as regards usage of these resources. In our Volta Basin, we have a number of uh, challenges, but the major challenges are all about management of water and environment. It's the deterioration of land and water, agricultural pollution, mining pollution, loss of biodiversity, flooding, drought, invasive plants, uh, and the uh, taking in, into account the opinions of local communities. This is the context within which the Volta Basin Authority committed to the resource management uh, agreement for the purposes of concerted management of shared resources through the implementation of various programs, be they in process, in the planning process, uh, or even completed in some cases. In this perspective, well, in this perspective, in order to scale up Cooperative management, the Volta Basin Authority, in conjunction with the IUCN, is laying the foundations for appropriation and implementation of this approach that we call nature-based solutions, using nature-based foundations as a mechanism to respond to flooding and drought in the Volta Basin. As we understand them, nature-based solutions are measures that get the best out of environmental and socioeconomic services in our ecosystems. I would quote, for instance, protective measures to protect our waterways and soil, the production of thresholds and bank protection works indeed water infrastructure works with vegetation, but also the restoration and sustainable management of wetlands and the restoration of arid regions in the uh, uh, sub-basin area. In particular, uh, in the uh, uh, tributaries and sub-tributaries. Ladies and gentlemen, you will have noticed that the Volta Basin Authority, ever since its creation, is, has been since its creation implementing this concept of nature-based solutions. And it's been doing so through a certain number of projects. I'd like to quote a couple of examples. First of all, we have a project called Flood and Drought Management in the Volta Basin. 
This is a project that is f f funded by the uh, Fund for Adapting to Climate Change. This is implemented by the uh, Water Basin and the OMM itself. We are currently mapping out risk areas. We are reinforcing the resilience of local communities, to quote but two examples. The second project I wanted to talk to you about, which is in process, it's called Reversing the Trend of Ecosystems and Water Deterioration in the Volta Basin. It's called REWARD, and it's funded by the FEM. This involves reinforcing capacity, for instance. We have another project called the Implementation of the Strategic Plans. This is funded by the FEM and the CIWA via the World Bank. We also have a water charter and are reinforcing the capacity and resilience of local communities, particularly in the field of environmental management. We also have a communications plan, among others. And finally, we're currently implementing a project called Regional Partnership for Water and the Environment in Central and, and Western Africa. This is a project that's funded by the ASDI. This is uh, based on the participation of uh, local populations in decision making. Finally, I apologize if I've been a bit quick on this, but I want to raise what I would call four key messages. From our point of view, in the Volta Basin, nature-based solutions are tools that bring together different national strategies and different national and international agreements and frameworks, such as the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, the Post-2020 Framework, for biodiversity, the Sendai framework, etc. Second important message is that implementing nature-based solutions, we are convinced, will not only generate environmental benefits, but also social and economic benefits for our populations. Third key message, we believe that it's ne absolutely necessary to reinforce capacities, but also to raise the awareness of all states uh, and local communities with a view not just to promoting a good understanding of the merits of nature-based solutions, but also as a, with a view to better cooperation in the implementation in wetlands. Final message. We have identified the need to develop projects that federate different countries. These are trans-border projects that are provide solutions to the specific uh, adverse impacts of climate change and demographic pressure in wetlands. By way of conclusion, we hope that by implementing nature-based solutions, we will reinforce the capacities of or the ability of ecosystems to provide environmental services and social economic benefits for our population. Secondly, we believe that nature-based solutions should take into account and even complete other types of involvement, such as engineering, IT projects, or financial instruments, for example. In this respect, the Volta Basin Authority believes that the success of nature-based solutions will depend on how the concept is understood, appropriated, but will also depend on the quality of interaction between men and women, but also between humankind and nature. Finally, the uh, uh, sustainability of nature-based solutions depends on a systemic approach, not just in the designing of these nature-based solutions, but in the way they're implemented. This is necessary if we are to uh, improve or cast light on decisional structures at local, national, and regional level. I'd like to thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Mr. Deswasi. And we can see when listening to your talk, the talking about the fact that nature-based solutions are not only for themselves and for the preservation that they allow of water resources and the ecosystems, but also for the social and economic benefits that they offer. And this is something very important to take into account if we're thinking about sustainable development. Thank you very much. I think that we can move on now and we will be taking in the chat any questions you might have and you can those of you who are here with us in the room you can think about the questions you might want to be asking Mr. Deswasi and to the other speakers who will be coming later on but we'll lead right into our presentation by Mr. Thierry uh, uh, Atovenerner from the uh, Madagascar in who's the director general technical director general for Water Clean to talk about the challenges of climate change in that country. It's obviously a country which is which is very much suffering as well from the impacts of climate change. So I would like to ask you what strategic decisions are being implemented to be able to uh, answer the challenges of climate change via nature-based solutions. Mr. Rata Voniana, I give you the floor. Are you uh, uh, loading your PowerPoint? I'd also like to remind our uh, while you're loading uh, the uh, the, uh, the PowerPoint, I'd like to just remind you that we have a chat for purposes of uh, interaction between us. Mr. Ratu Vonyanyana, have you? Can you see my screen? No, we haven't got on our screens just yet. Yeah. Do you see my screen now? We have the screen. Now, if you click on the bottom right, it will uh, display on the full screen. Bottom right hand corner on the red line. Is that working? Is that on full screen? No? Not yet? Would you like us to share that presentation for you? If you like, we can do that for you. OK, well, then, if you close down your screen share uh, function, we will, we will do it from here. Now we have it. Okay, thank you for inviting us to uh, share with you. This is an opportunity for us to uh, tell you what's happening, uh, what we are doing in the terms of protection of our catchment basin. Madagascar one of the countries that are faced with climate, the problems of climate change, in particular, there has been substantial impact on our water resources. Our idea is to share with you our experience, in particular, uh, regarding the catchment basin of Lake Itasi. In Madagascar, like everywhere else, we have been affected by climate change. In particular, there have been uh, extreme impacts, and in fact, sometimes a lot of damage, considerable damage. I just mentioned uh, a disruption of our hydraulic system, a lowering of our water tables, 
an impact on our rivers and the, the, uh, our water resources. Sources have uh, partly dried up, and there have also been restrictions on uh, river water, river catchment areas, particularly for the purposes of irrigation. This has been more particularly the case in the, the south and in uh, mangroves. Insofar as possible, we have uh, integrated uh, all uh, everything we can in sustainable uh, development plans. Given these difficulties, we have identified a number of measures that we believe are suitable for Madagascar. As solutions, we have identified to the promotion of integrated water resource management. We have a body that's managed by the uh, uh, comes under the authority of the Ministry of Water. It's called the ANDEA, the National Authority for Water and Water Sanitation. Uh, this body manages all water resource-related activities. For example, the quality of water, the operation of our waterways. We have also got what we call AGIR structures that we have operated, or that we operate, should I say, via the ANDEA, the National Authority for Water and Sanitation. We also have water monitoring and management. In, in Madagascar in particular, we have uh, rainwater stations where we measure and observation, uh, we measure and observe water levels, the level of uh, water tables. And finally, we have what we call the National Plan for Adaptation to Climate Change in Madagascar. According to this national plan, the government's uh, uh, powers have been reinforced. We have uh, priority sectors identified, and we have funding for adaptation to climate change. Now, just for just to remind you, in Madagascar, we are working in uh, cooperation with the Mediterranean Water Authority, but we are working together to uh, protect the catchment area of uh, Lake Itasi. So in early 2010, the cooperation, which was already in existence, in 2010, and in fact since 2018, we set up a Lake Itasi Management Committee. This is a local committee that manages the protection of Lake Itasi. This is the southern aspect, southern side, I should say, with a, uh, an area of about 677 square kilometers and a minimum altitude of 1,223 meters and a maximum altitude of 1,826 meters. There are a lot of small communities that uh, benefit from the work of our water management agency. In the case of this catchment area, we have to work on the soil. There's a lot of work has been put in uh, to offset the effects of human intervention. There have been, uh, have been an ongoing division of, uh, of uh, plots of land. Uh, these are anthropometric factors, but there are also geomorphological factors, such as erosion and sanding. About 70% of the lake are affected by erosion. Sand levels have been affected by sedimentation, transportation, and, of course, mining upstream of of the Varahina rivers. And, of course, the formation of lavacas uh, have led to an increase in mud levels and increased sand in the bottom of the, of the, the lake. Of course, mining has also contributed to the level of sand and pollution in Lake Itasi. There's also the way the uh, soil is used. 50% of the catchment area is in under cereals and uh, 
the savannas, uh, savanna covers 34% of the very sensitive area. This is an area that's very sensitive to wildfires. Of course, there are a number of uh, species and habits that have disappeared. And of course, agricultural usage has changed. 80% of the population works in the agricultural sector of Itasi. And there's been a promotion of uh, uh, various different cultures that have not, or various different series that have not uh, improved the situation. Just a few words about the medium term vision that's been adopted to improve the situation at Lake Itasi. In order to preserve and get the very best out of the catchment area of Lake Itasi, the following priority measures have been taken or will be taken in the medium term. I'm blessing them now improvement of agricultural practices and compliance with good growing practices, stabilization of levels, anti erosion measures in plots, promotion of agroforestry, plantation and forestry, which is again to fight against soil erosion, the plantation of hedgerows, again to uh, prevent soil erosion, and the production of solid compost in order to reinstate the organic fertility of soil and to preserve the quality of water uh, and uh, reduce the use of chemical uh, entrance. And of course, rewooding of marginalized areas that have been eroded with sharp uh, slopes. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Mm. Thank you very much. By your presentation, we can see another aspect. We talked about the cross-border aspect at first, and here this is uh, clearly agricultural customs, which are most important, and uh, the, ch the impact of which you're trying to attenuate via these nature-based solutions. Thank you very much for your presentation, sir, which also reminds us about the interest of uh, the cooperation that you've engaged in with international organizations. So to, we've talked about the cross-border aspect, we've talked a bit about agriculture, but now I would like us to talk a bit about industrial aspects. We've got the pleasure to have with us, and right here in presence, Ms. Marie-Christine Uo, who works for the Olia Water, and who's going to be presenting us about what the industrial sector is working on this issue, actually, that I would like to ask you is that Veolia is a exem an example of uh, its work with ecology, development of green energy, also with uh, complex pollution treatment issues. So how has the nature-based solutions been incorporated into your priorities into these processes? Thank you very much for your question. Hello to everyone. Uh, I too am going to speak in French, if that's okay. Can you uh, show the slides for me? If you could have uh, your slides. And I can switch through, is that right? Apparently, uh, no, it will be done for you, don't worry. Just to come back to your question. The answer to your question is very straightforward. There's no reason to oppose these solutions. There aren't nature-based solutions on the one hand and uh, a, another set of uh, solutions on the contrary. These all uh, dovetail with one another and nature-based solutions by comparison with more conventional treatment, they actually complete one another. They complete one another because all these solutions have their own limits. We've already mentioned a number of uh, uh, aspects in previous presentations. It takes time. This is uh, the living world, and it takes time for solutions to take effect. But one of the advantages of our technical conventions is that they produce immediate responses, particularly in the field of pollution. However, we can't just content ourselves with saying they're conventional and, on the one hand, and then nature-based solutions without uh, being eco-friendly the activities that we carry out in our territories will not survive. So that's how we operate, the two together. Now, in, on a more practical note, and to show you in more concrete terms what we have been talking about in terms of benefits, I want to take two examples to illustrate this. One is an, an industrial example taken from China, it's not something that happened in very recent times. 
In other words, that's a way of saying that we didn't, haven't started reacting just in recent years, but with alongside Sinopec in China, Sinopec is the biggest petrochemical company in China and Asia, in other words, often termed a polluter. But Sinopec asked uh, Veolia many years ago to handle the treatment of its wastewater. This was particularly with a view to treating industrial waste. But with China, which has been uh, under hydric stress for a few years now, we couldn't be in any way dependent on uh, wastewater, even treated wastewater, and a resource of uh, natural uh, reservoirs, uh, uncovered uh, uh, reservoirs, being seeing levels reduced. Local populations need drinking water, and we had to manage this differently. On this slide here, you'll see that when the decision was taken in 2017 to uh, rehabilitate a wetland of eight hectares, this enabled us to uh, resupply the reservoir that you see on the bottom. It's actually a lake that's very sensitive to change, climatic changes and very often uh, under hydric stress. In other words, the water level is low, if you prefer. So very clearly, the nature-based solutions uh, come in addition to more conventional solutions and uh, help us adapt to uh, climate change, in this particular instance, to low water levels. In practice, if you see top and bottom pictures, you see in green, green is what we call the rehabilitation area of wetlands that have been completely dried out. So to protect the reservoir, this is the New Kuyu Reservoir, where drinking water is, is, is uh, produced. So after a number of years, you'll see the benefits. I mentioned the importance of uh, checking and measuring the benefits. Well, you can see them here on the screen. I'm just going to mention four. The first is the improved quality of water. By rehabilitating these eight hectares in uh, multi-terraces, 23 different terraced levels, this enabled us to improve the environmental quality of water uh, stemming from uh, treated wastewater, or industrial wastewater. Of course, uh, nature's uh, job is what's known as phytoremediation. But a second benefit, again mentioned by our uh, compare, is the uh, social benefits. This enabled us to open up a whole new field of positive externalities. In other words, to create recreational areas. This is something that's also developing in France with the uh, activities of the Conservatoire du Littoral, as it's known. So it creates a completely new positive dynamic in terms of uh, social benefits for the community. The third set of benefits is the increased awareness of all generations. First of all, for the younger generations, as you can see here at this uh, IUCN Congress, but it also involves raising awareness of the, as regards the benefits of these solutions. We can't live with nature aside from humankind. Nature has to be integrated. All too often in urbanization, we felt that we didn't need nature, that we could set nature aside or leave it aside. I think we've now become aware of the fact that there's nothing wrong with nature on the country and that humankind must uh, live in close conjunction with nature. This is our saving grace. Here you have examples of uh, raising awareness through exhibitions and guided, uh, guided visits. And f the fourth uh, uh, benefit, not the least important by any means, is the rehabilitation of fauna and flora. Through these 23 terraced levels, which were well thought out, I have to say, we had a, uh, an architect who created uh, corridors and different habitats in the terraced areas to enable certain species to redevelop, be it birds, be they birds or uh, uh, bactrations, 
or fish. This is something that is really designed. It's, it's a form of architecture, and certainly the benefits are there, as the uh, our MC said. These me benefits are clearly measurable. I'd like to give you a second example. This is the opposite effect as regards adapting to climate change. Either we have not got enough water or we have too much. I'm going to give you a French example, not a recent one, of having too much water. Uh, we didn't. This is the case of the Bièvre Valley in the Paris region. This is west of Paris. The Bièvre Valley was heavily flooded, and the most important of these floods was back in 1982. It uh, created very substantial damage to the southwest of Paris. Here, in practice, what we did was worked very closely and in conjunction with traditional uh, techniques, traditional technologies, and uh, nature-based solutions, working together. In particular, and I'm saying this uh, uh, in front of my colleagues, thanks to the uh, healthy waters of Normandy, we had natural waterways. But initially, and in many other places, waterways are often deemed to be areas where you can walk and the well, ponds and, and uh, lakes should be full. Uh, or if it's uh, very dry, uh, we will have all sorts of uh, invasive species or cyanobacterium. Um, we worked on this with the uh, water agency. The idea was to uh, enhance the merits, enhance and, and uh, implement uh, nature-based solutions. We sometimes forget that so-called permanent waterways don't actually fulfill their natural function, which is uh, uh, to uh, drain and irrigate. So with the water agency, we acted as a, a buffer to absorb a lot of water when there's too much, but also to irrigate nature when required. This is uh, over the full year with all its, the full cycle. Now, things don't happen overnight. Nature is part of the living world, and it works at its own pace. Another thing we changed, particularly using conventional solutions alongside nature-based solutions, is that we changed the way uh, uh, open-air hydraulics are regulated. To eventually, uh, to conventionally, uh, hydraulic engineers regulate water levels between point A and B, whence the uh, numerous canals we have. But here what we changed was the decision was taken to use uh, different methods of uh, regulating water levels underwater levels to uh, facilitate dispersion into ponds and lakes in order to optimize the filling or emptying of these waterways and ponds depending on weather conditions. In practice, as you can see on the next slide, what this gives us is that we are regulating nature and waterways. We let them live, we let them breathe, and when we have a a big storm, we know this in advance with, thanks to our radars, well, we can empty or fill waterways, as the case may be, to uh, optimize our capacity for temporary stocking as one form of uh, hydraulic regulation. To wrap up, since 1982, we've had a lot of big storms in the Paris region, and we have never had any flooding since 1982. Up to very recently, when we Paris was uh, flooded for a couple of days, but we had no such problem in the Bièvre Valley, which probably the only part of the region that had no flooding problems. So, again, as I said, by way of conclusion, if I could make just a recommendation, if only for food for thought, if you like, well, how can we accelerate this good combination between conventional methods and nature-based solutions? Well, do not forget that. This needs maintenance. Any living system needs to be maintained, which means that you need an economic contractual model to manage and regulate nature if we are to uh, fulfill all the functions of our waterways. Thank you.
Micro numéro 1, s'il vous plaît. Micro numéro 1, merci. Thank you very much, Ms. Uo, for that presentation. It's true, this very last point you've mentioned is particularly important. It's important to recall that nature-based solutions are, at the end of the day, infrastructures. And since they are green infrastructures, one must be able to allocate a budget for the design, management, and maintenance of these infrastructures and also foresee the training for those professionals who will be managing these nature-based solutions. In the coming years, we're going to need significant investments around training for professionals in ecological engineering, for example. It's true that's a very important point to remember. I'd like to go right over to English now. We'll uh, introduce two. Uh, English uh, speaker, two panelists uh, from the Georgian uh, region, from the country and region. Uh, first, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Marwan Al Ragad, um, who is executive director of the Inter Islamic Network for uh, the management of uh, management and development of water resources. I would like to hear from you about uh, what your network is doing on the promotion of uh, NATO based uh, solutions uh, and also how. How can this help to build some partnership for the region? Thank you. Thank you for so much. Assalamu uh, alaikum. First of all, I would like to thank IUCN, the participants of this session on this important topic. Uh, so, uh, in Wardan, the Inter Islamic Network of Water Resources Development and Management, uh, through its 2020 2030 vision, aims to assist communities uh, that are struggling to balance water usage by taking into consideration the dignity and well-being of inhabitants. Uh, Northern also promotes collaboration and cooperation to achieve uh, the sustainable economies, uh, common interests, and building up the capacities of our member countries for extending over the OIC uh, network. Uh, the water stress uh, is massive at the OIC level, and this water stress uh, is, is caused mainly by agriculture. Uh, agriculture at the OIC withdraws a deficit of 31% of the global agricultural water, and that's a massive amount considering that we're having 25% uh, of the population. Uh, this amount is used mainly for irrigation, and uh, out of that, I think more than 85 90% is used for grains production, uh, which represent, uh, sorry, it was 68% of the total agricultural yield. Uh, but our mapping, unfortunately, uh, showed that there will be a reduction in grain production in the region or in the OIC region. And this reduction may reach up to 15% between the year 2000 and 2030. And this is mainly due to water shortage and the climate change with extended uh, drought events. Uh, if we analyze the most uh, uh, major components of the water demand in our countries, uh, we can see an increasing demand by 5% uh, year, and this is combined with 3% in the population. Uh, we're having a, a, a transition uh, toward uh, sustainable energy and renewable energy. This is why you can see that countries in the Middle East, uh, Turkey, Iraq, Egypt, Sudan, and, and Ethiopia mainly, they are really focusing on this transition toward sustainable economies with higher power production. I think that the hydropower production here is changing the, the uh, hydropolitical map of the region and adding more stresses uh, on the local community. Um, so, uh, based on, on what was published by the, the Economic World Forum uh, last year, that uh, we're having a clear status of uh, climate change failure. And that means uh, we are not acting to the climate, and that's increasing the problem. And here we should indicate that. Uh, no action would be very high in the coming decade, 2030. Uh, so out of that, we can explore and we can see that uh, nature-based solutions at local and basin and regional scales can be a, a good solution to sustain economies and to sustain different livelihood communities living uh, in those areas. Can be also as a catalyst uh, to human equity and sustainable resources management. But the nature-based solution can be uh, efficient Catalyst, as we mentioned, the leafy nexus, and in this domain, we can think in, in different levels. We're having the, the traditional 
by implementing nature-based solutions like uh, different uh, water harvesting, uh, greening of different uh, desert areas, slopes management. But we still can't think out of the box and we can think in an innovative way. And here uh, we may think of different uses of the nature solutions to help us in empowering community. We may give an example on using the solar energy in, uh, uh, in different uh, aspects of uh, food processing and the geothermal energy. But we do believe that we need to start uh, a new nature-based solution paradigm. And this uh, paradigm shift is, is comparing the current paradigm and the new paradigm that we are looking for. Uh, the current paradigm is rigid, is stagnant, slow, repetitive, and supply driven and local uh, on the scale. While we are looking for a paradigm that is creative, pragmatic, dynamic, market driven for sustainability and good plant, and we may go to the regional level. The current paradigm unfortunately focuses on studies and on blind theoretical capacity building. We are also giving grants and small grants that even doesn't move the needle and does not have any impact on the ground. We should focus on field execution. We should use the nature as a natural lab, practical training, and we should be uh, able to sign contracts uh, and, uh, for grants and the execution of nature-based solution for the sustainability. We applied this paradigm shift in, uh, uh, at Inwardam together with our partners in the uh, Smart Desert Project. Uh, which is funded by AFD with partnership of IUCN Rua in, in Jordan, uh, in Wardam, uh, Green Tech from private sector, Horizon and Common as uh, NGOs. Uh, so the Smart Desert, the project uh, uh, nature-based solution strategy, is based on the importance of nature-based solutions to achieve resilience and empowered community. We're talking about the, the economic empowerment of the community. Uh, our strategy here is based on the introduction of different models nature-based solution, including uh, best practices in environment, including solar food processing, non-conventional water resources such as saline, treated and harvested water. And there is uh, an important topic uh, based on the ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction. So all together will finally contribute to the water energy food ecosystem nexus that is based on nature-based solution. The idea here, is to implement this model in Jordan, test this model, upscale it to the region with the help of our partners in Jordan. But here I would like to stress on the point uh, raised by our colleague and partner, Ali Hayajna from IUC Amroa, that it's important to measure the performance of our NBS. It's also important to uh, work on uh, the sustainability through the uh, introduction of the private sector uh, to the system. So, uh, I'm receiving messages that my sound is not clear. Is that right? It is, yeah. Mm. Oh, sorry. Oh, is it clear now? It's clearer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in order uh, to have uh, our uh, practices done, we should work more on the understanding uh, this we need to understand better uh, the geology, geography, and the human dimension of any area is uh, a key uh, uh, issue in finding the suitable uh, NBS. What is needed at the regional level is to have human development and capacity building. We need to use and invest nature-based solution for job creation and women and youth empowerment. Also, regional nature-based solution project can be used as a tool of confidence building. What we believe is needed here uh, from the region that there's a demand now for a basin wide or a region wide area that involves all the stakeholders at the basin level as we are dealing with the transboundary basins in the Middle East and North African areas. We need to build a young nature based solution professional network. And here I'm quoting our uh, uh, Islamic world water vision we, need, we should catch them young, educate them, and empower them for the future. Uh, finally, our message uh, is based on reading the maps. So reading the Middle East, North African map with the natural and the human dimension, it's given us the impression and the understanding that we are having nature-based solutions in the region since more than 7,000 years. We are having the oldest well-known dam in the world in Jordan, 10,000 years old. 
uh, same maps show that each country or geographical area uh, or ethnic group is distinguished by the presence of certain resources and natural based solutions and skills. And therefore, I think we should work more on the integration, which will lead to the water and food security based on the use of the environmental and natural resources. Uh, this is strongly dependent on our ability to dialogue and learn from the other. And here we should invest our diversity and inclusion for the union and confidence. Uh, thank you so much, and I'm sorry for the technical issues with, with the audio. No problem. Thank you, Dr. Romawan Al-Ragad. That was a very nice uh, presentation. And um, here, um, I really appreciated the fact you were uh, same as Ali reminding that uh, assessing performance uh, of uh, NBS is now uh, one of the core priorities because the concept has been uh, set, the uh, measures have been designed and implemented, now we need some, some assessment and just a small uh, footnote on that, uh, we will have another event on Natubase solution tomorrow at 11, uh, same hall but uh, room number uh, 5. Mayor de Corail, and uh, we will touch upon this issue of assessing the performance of, of NATO-based solutions. And here, for this panel so far, we've seen uh, when we needed, where we needed cooperation at transboundary level with the Volta Basin Authority. Uh, we've seen cooperation between uh, local authorities, uh, in the case of Madagascar, Madagascar, between industrial players with Veolia and Yanshan. Um, and right now we've seen interstate corporations through networks to try and improve uh, the implementation of NATO-based solutions. I would like now to turn to research and innovation, and we will be able to do that thanks to Dr. Ma Al-Zubi, who is a researcher on agricultural, agricultural water uh, at the International Water Management Institute. Uh, Dr. Ma Al-Zubi, I would like to start with one question, how research and innovation can support the uptake of NATO-based solutions? You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, um, uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, the organizer for uh, this kind invitation. And um, um, as a, a final speaker, uh, hopefully uh, everyone is, is still uh, 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 interested in this session and, uh, and uh, discussion, and you are still motivated. Um, so my intervention, I will be uh, zooming to uh, talk about uh, MENA region and solutions um, uh, that can um, uh, be done in MENA region. So, um, uh, but before that, let me quickly just um, introduce, uh, I'm trying just to move my screen. Yeah, let me just quickly uh, introduce uh, the International Water Management Institute um, as um, a research uh, for development uh, non-profit organization uh, with uh, 13 offices uh, or 13 um, uh, with offices in 13 countries and a global uh, uh, network of uh, scientists operating in more than 30 countries. Uh, we work with uh, uh, or at different scales and various stakeholders like uh, governments, farmers, uh, uh, water managers, uh, development partners and businesses to solve uh, water problems and scale up solutions. Um, we have a regional office in Cairo and recently we opened an office in Hamman, uh, uh, Jordan. Uh, so our strategy actually uh, for the 2019-2023 uh, 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 responds directly to the demand uh, for innovation and uh, scientifically test tested water management solutions for uh, sustainable development. Uh, with this in mind, uh, we consider three strategic programs, um, uh, water, food and ecosystem water, climate change and resilience, and water growth and inclusion, with a, a fourth cross-cutting program pillar on digital innovation. So uh, for over uh, th three decades, um, our research results um, have led to changes in water management uh, that have uh, contributed to social and economic um, development. Um, focusing on MENA, let me just uh, quickly remind you with the uh, major um, 
um, uh, development challenges, actually, um, in terms of water scarcity, drought, uh, limited water for agriculture uh, uh, activity, uh, population growth, um, the fragility and conflicts um, on that as well, uh, youth in unemployment, the high rate uh, of, of that, the gender inequalities, uh, plus further uh, or weak um, institutional governance and policy settings and uh, rural uh, urban divide. So, uh, and further, I want to stress that climate change already have a significant impact on many ecosystem services affecting livelihood and human well-being in the MENA. Uh, therefore, adaptation and the mitigation measures are required to secure food production and the fresh water availability uh, and increase its resilience uh, to more extreme climate events such as drought, uh, floods, land landslides uh, and forest uh, fires. Um, to respond to climate change, there is a global growing actually recognition that um, um, a nature-based solution can provide cost-effective and sustainable alternatives to hard engineering or gray infrastructure to adapt to future uh, climate conditions, considering a range of ecosystem services. And we, just in this um, session, uh, so uh, a couple of uh, great uh, examples. So despite the global uh, recognition, the uh, ecosystem in Nina face a couple of barriers like uh, weak governance of natural uh, systems, uh, lack of evidences on nature-based solutions, effectiveness and resilience, uh, lack of awareness and, and knowledge uh, on the topic, and inadequate financial resources, lack of business models and limited investment in nature-based solutions, uh, limited partnerships among uh, multi-stakeholders. Um, however, uh, there are like some enablers and many enablers can push the act and impact of the uh, nature-based solution forward in the region. Uh, for example, um, we need more coherent policies, plans, acts and legislations. We need economic instruments. We need innovation and technologies, uh, education and training, knowledge sharing mechanisms and partnerships among the stakeholders. And this is very important uh, when it comes to um, uh, Co 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 cohesion and, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, more um, uh, integrated uh, uh, actions. Uh, so uh, what, e what EMI is doing, uh, and this is uh, just like a few examples, we uh, do integrate ecosystem values and services and sustainability into our uh, activities and action. We do assessment of trade-offs and synergies in applying in portfolios of belt um, and natural water infrastructure. Plus, uh, we develop knowledge on the hydrological impacts of uh, restoration, uh, so on and so forth. And our research on socioeconomic impacts uh, of ecosystem degradation apply to ensure that governance and incentives for protection and restoration of water related ecosystems strengthen uh, the Equality and uh, the equality and inclusion. Uh, here, more like into uh, uh, exactly more specific uh, projects uh, in Mina. We have so many, but um, uh, let me just uh, like uh, confirm that um, nature-based solution is an, just an umbrella term for a range of approaches and activities, including uh, IWR. Um, and uh, source water protection, water harvesting, agriculture pest management, so on and so forth. Uh, and EMI, uh, as a research for development organization, is adopting most of these approaches while contributing scientific-based solutions and innovation. So uh, in MENA, for example, in Egypt and Lebanon, for, we, we introduced web and phone-based tools to improve the timing of water applications and irrigation schemes and support the better planning of a cropping uh, cycle according to soil uh, type, irrigation system, crop system, etc. 
in Jordan, uh, EB is designing, implementing, and promoting water saving technology for agriculture while strengthening the capacity of national institutions to monitor water saving through on farm water accounting. Um, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, in Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, EMI, uh, with the support from USAID, is working to improve the drought management and enhance resilience to climate change. Uh, so um, our research actually results uh, have led to changes in water management that have contributed to social and um, economic development. Um, and my last slide, actually, I need just to confirm on cooperation and uh, just um, a message that nature-based solution has a great potential within the MENA context, yet to scale it up, there is a need to increase knowledge to support decision-making uh, process. We need a common criteria to assess both natural uh, nature-based solution and gray solutions. We need a coherent set of parameters or standards for nature-based uh, solutions and operations. So building on the existing efforts and successes in MENA, EMI will continue uh, delivering evidence-based research and innovation and building partnership to accelerate the impact at scale. So I would encourage um, uh, uh, like visiting our webpage uh, website uh, for more information about um, e uh, EMI. And uh, we are looking forward to bilaterally uh, or, or collectively to talk about opportunities of collaboration in the MENA. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mazubi. We do need uh, research and innovation, of course, to make informed decisions uh, on uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, and, and that's something we, we should always keep in mind to invest in research and innovation. Right now, uh, I'll ask our panelists online to stay connected, uh, as we will now take questions uh, from the floor. Uh, so it's uh, your time. To, to be active. I see a few hands raised here. Uh, we'll take three at least to begin with. Uh, so here at the back of the room and then uh, the, the two in the middle. And uh, I remember that you raised your hand. Thanks, you have the floor. From the West Asia North Africa Institute from Jordan. I have a question on the nature-based solution. It's not something new, but um, why is it gaining momentum right now? Uh, can we say because it's adaptation and mitigation to climate change or it's something else? I'm not sure who can uh, answer this. <laughs> So uh, I repeat the question why you give uh, the mic to uh, the second uh, question in the audience. Um, the question was, uh, natural-based solutions are not that new, but why are they coming up now? What, what is the reason for that? Uh, and a second question here, we'll take three to, to begin with. Yeah. Oui, bonjour. Good day, I've got two questions. One for Mr. Ratovonian and another for Ms. Uo. The first is more of a uh, I would just like to know, I'm curious in the techniques that you've been using about the Lake Itasi, you've also been using the very, very, the stabilization of the banks, the method that you've been using for the stabilization of the banks and for using vetiver. And for Ms. Uo, for the wetlands renovation, is that uh, upstream or downstream of the purification plant? Thank you. Oui, uh, par à la In terms of the question that you've just asked about what we're doing for the stabilization of the banks, yes, indeed, we use vetiver with the purpose of protecting from erosion and also to make sure that there are habitats, habitats for the birds. So the vetiver is used precisely for that stabilization. Thank you. Yes, and Ms. Yule, your answer? Well, for the question, yes, of course, it's uh, downstream. It is the treated wastewater that feeds back into the reservoir and that then goes into the restored wetlands. 
thanks to which we can correct the ecological quality and maintain uh, a proper wetlands and thus reduce the risk of hydric stress for the reservoir that is downstream. It's like a water, an additional water treatment barrier, which is at an intermediate stage. And as far as the question about whether or not the uh, nature-based solutions are completely new, would you like to say something? Well, I've got the microphone, so I'll give an answer. Why is it that we're speaking so much about NBS today? Well, one of the arguments that you've also seen in the examples I gave you is uh, not uh, actually it's been around for quite a long time. And one of the responses is that these solutions work in a way that one can also adapt to the different climate changes in one direction or another, which cannot be done via uh, classical treatment. So these are solutions which uh, have that particular advantage in that they can be a type of uh, barrier. They can regulate. They can be a sponge when there's too much water. They can also be as a sponge when the, there's too much water to make sure that it doesn't flow too quickly. In terms of the high and uh, mid water levels, I would say that urbanization and the speed of climate change means that water is actually moving too quickly. Water is no longer held back as nature would have in the past because the soil is less fertile than it used to be since we are building more upon nature. So that could be one of the reasons. And to uh, another thing we can say, this, these NBSs are ways to complete the more intense treatment that's carried out by uh, broad solutions, which are at the end of the day a type of break to the natural water cycle in these buffers, for example. And that's one of the benefits that it has as well. Okay. Uh, du coup, merci pour vos Thank you very much for your presentation. I've got a question that perhaps is connected with the first one we've heard. You've all presented projects that you've been talking about in relation to NBS. But when these projects were designed, did you actually use the term at that time? Or what, how would, what would you say is the relation to that, this term of NBS with the other names and the other types of processes you were using before? Oui, bonjour. If you would uh, allow me to, I just have a little question I want to ask. And I can get back to this based on what I've heard before. In fact, the term nature-based solution is somewhat ambiguous. When you hear the term nature-based solution, one has the impression that you're going to be implementing solutions in which nature will just take care of itself somehow to solve the problem. And that, of course, that's partly truth, but that's not the entire truth. I think we could avoid these types of uh, ambiguities if we understood that nature-based solution is, above all, solutions which are respectful of nature. And so we're not counting on nature to offer the solution to the problem that we've created, but rather we are trying to resolve the problem that we have created or that's been created for various reasons to work towards the minimum amount of degradation and using nature to do so if possible. Thank you. Oui, bonjour. Good morning. I'm the Director General of the uh, Water Agency for the Rhone and Course, and I would like to uh, thank Mr. Rato Vonyaina for the collaboration that we've had together with uh, Madagascar in different experiments that he's been talking about around Lake Itasi. My question is about the possibilities to generalize this experience, this very interesting experience about Lake Itasi around Madagascar. Does he believe that this solution and nature-based solutions, including different agricultural solutions for the region, could be generalized, extended to other regions of Madagascar? Do they have enough uh, know-how and experience to be able to do so? knowing that there's other cooperation that uh, other organizations they could offer support. But basically, the question is, is this an experience that you think could be extended to other territories? Oui, à mon avis, parce que c'est une expérience. Yeah. 
Yes, to my mind, uh, this is uh, experimental. It's the first time I've seen uh, such a, an idea. I believe it could be shared because there are other entities that haven't tried this experiment. So I believe, yes, it, it could be uh, rolled out elsewhere. It could be shared with other entities, I've certainly experimented in uh, other entities before uh, rolling it out more generally. So again, as I said, a couple more experiments before rolling it out more generally. Thank you. Patrice Ebar from uh, Côte d'Ivoire. I work in, the, in, uh, in West Africa within an organization. My, the whole issue of water is of great interest to us, but uh, this is my question for Mr. Uh, Dewasi from the uh, Volta Basin, Monsieur Dewasi from the uh, Volta Basin Authority. Earlier on, he explained that nature-based solutions had been experimented in certain projects, but he didn't uh, enumerate these uh, solutions. I'd be interested if he could give us a few examples. But to follow up on that, we have a number of uh, thematic networks in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. We also work on uh, Uh, the management of river basins, particularly in mining areas. And we would be very interested in cooperation with any organization interested in working on this issue of uh, river basins or catchment basins in mining areas. This has been mentioned before, but we're interested. Thank you. And I believe we have one last question here. I'm from Palestine. I am uh, also a can uh, council member of IUCN. Uh, well, in fact, uh, uh, for this uh, kind of, uh, uh, it's not a real question, but it's a comment, uh, and excuse me a little bit, just to elaborate. Nature-based solution, as has been mentioned, it is not an, a new issue, and it is not an old issue, but rather it is something that uh, now it become more urgent because the pressure we are causing as a human being on nature is really increasing, and that's why we are advocating for adapting uh, this kind of uh, uh, old and new uh, concept so that we can really uh, go back to it, uh, uh, allow nature to go back to its original uh, duties and services that it is providing to provide the system, the, the services that is needed for human being. Uh, from all the examples that we have just uh, been uh, seeing, it is all related to water and this is, it is, uh, it is not a surprise because water is the key element in this in, in nature so that it's of course it is all related to water and of course providing uh, uh, clean drinking water it is important for human survival and for for ecosystems uh, to survive and for everything but of course nature-based solution does not really only related to water it is also related to other aspects of nature whether it is uh, the regeneration of the rangeland uh, or uh, other other issues uh, other than uh, than water and of course it is uh, done at the ecosystem level, at the catchment level, at the basin level, interstate level, etc. However, I just would like to mention something, and I agree totally with uh, my colleague Ali, that there is no one size fit all, and there is many challenges, especially in our region, where the, the, the resources are very scarce, and of course, Dr. Zabi has listed nine challenges uh, facing our uh, we, uh, MENA region. And under this kind of challenges, I don't think it will be easy to adapt or to advocate even for nature-based solutions. Uh, you still can do that, but of course, understanding these challenges, it is also much, much more, much more important and see how you can really introduce this concept under this kind of challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now the floor is to our panelists. Uh, we've seen that we had the end raised for Mr. Robert Desoisy. Monsieur Desoisy, est-ce que vous voulez prendre la parole pour répondre? To Desoisy, would you like to answer that, that question put to you? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I'd like to begin by answering the question about why now? Why are we now using nature-based solutions? To my mind, nature-based solutions are because of the collapse of the uh, ecosystems we have. And of course, solutions are not the same from uh, one wetland to another type of uh, ecosystem. There are particularities, but the, what they have in common is that man is at the very heart of these nature-based solutions. Men, women, young people, everybody. They are aware of the need to reverse this deterioration, this deterioration of resources they are dependent upon. So uh, this is uh, an opportunity to remedy a situation which uh, remedy a problem which tends to have a, an adverse impact on their very existence. My uh, brother from Côte d'Ivoire mentioned this, but we believe that since uh, the creation of the uh, Volta Basin Authority in 2007, everything we have done is part of our integrated management of water resources. Nature-based solutions simply underline the importance of ecosystems and the services that ecosystems provide to wetlands and to humankind in general. Ninety percent, ninety-five percent of the time, if not all of the time, uh, the areas concerned are wetlands that uh, local communities need for their very survival. This is why we're increasingly numerous in uh, being worried the fact by the fact that these resources are decreasing. We need to reinforce capacity, and we need to solve problems specific to particular types of ecosystem. Um, other solutions, well, among other solutions, we need knowledge. If we're going to talk about wetlands and the collapse of these wetlands, we need, first of all, to assess the state of these ecosystems. This is what we're doing with uh, what we are doing in our integrated risk management system, particularly in the case of soil, uh, soil erosion on the Volta Basin. Now, I only had 10 minutes. I hadn't time to go into any great detail, but we have a lot of examples we could quote. I'd be very happy uh, to uh, hear from you by email or otherwise, if you prefer, to talk about this together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. De uh, To reply on the question, Regarding the momentum for nature-based solutions, Dr. Mal Zubi, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, um, to answer the, this question, we need to, maybe first we need to understand like why, and then uh, who is calling for that uh, momentum, and uh, how uh, to start with why. Uh, especially in the MENA region, we are facing um, uh, the most scarce, uh, let's say, uh, era in terms of water uh, resources. Um, uh, most of water resources actually in the region is come is is mostly transboundary, so um, uh, that leaves the most of countries um, unsecure. Um, plus, 85% uh, of fresh water is used for agriculture. That means we can't stop agriculture activity. Uh, we need more water to um, uh, the water we needed to to be used more efficiently uh, uh, and uh, uh, keep the productivity as well in the agriculture sector. Um, on top of that, we have the, the climate change impact is hitting uh, badly the the region. So uh, adaptation is really needed. So uh, uh, this is just among of other uh, like. Uh, reasons why we need this. So um, let's go back to who. Who is calling for more momentum or action 
and acts and impact. Uh, it's more scientists, researchers, CPOs, NGOs, because they are uh, feeling more the, the how bad is the situation. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, we still have a gap between uh, researchers, scientists, and uh, let's say policy and decision makers. So um, uh, that's why, uh, because we, we do believe that business as usual and um, doing the same uh, uh, business uh, as before uh, in silo, it's not going to lead us to anywhere. Uh, plus, uh, how can we uh, do that? Uh, it's more by cooperation, uh, by joint efforts uh, between all stakeholders uh, to be able to uh, start to see some lights uh, on ground. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mahal Zoubi. Uh, Peut-être aussi une réaction sur euh, le commentaire qui était fait entre solutions fondées sur la nature ou solutions respectueuses de la nature. Madame Marie-Christine Huot, si vous le souhaitez. Oui, effectivement, c'est... Ah, intéressant commentaire. Mais pour éviter toute misunderstanding, il y a une grande différence entre uh, respecting nature and nature-based solutions. The word says it very clearly, nature-based, and we're based on uh, techniques. Uh, nature-based solutions are based on the, on the intelligence of nature. But it's a whole network of expertise and knowledge that we're calling on. And it's thanks to this development that I believe that nature-based solutions will expand and uh, become increasingly important. I think we'll gradually become increasingly aware of uh, the uh, fundamentals of agronomics. We've talked about soil, water, there's also the plant world. And all these forms of expertise uh, are combined to construe, devise nature-based solutions. Now, we shouldn't go too far, as we maybe did in with chemicals, and use nature-based solutions incorrectly. If I could quote an example, when you reconstitute hedgerows to improve f uh, soil fertility in, uh, in uh, swampy areas to enable soils to absorb water, because you need a radical system or a root-based system to uh, nourish soil, this is indeed a nature-based solution, because we are using what uh, uh, nature does between roots, soil, and water. Likewise, when we protect cetaceans, well, uh, cetaceans are vital. The, the very process and behavior of cetaceans is vital. We can organize what we call biomimetics because cetaceans will absorb plankton. This plays an essential role. This process could actually or can actually be a solution that completes uh, the uh, solutions of uh, basic chemicals or basic chemistry. So I think we're using nature, we're, we're calling these nature based solutions, but in the IUCN solutions, nature based solutions should respect nature, they should be nature friendly and uh, use the benefits of nature to reduce the adverse effects of climate change in particular, but they must also be uh, biodiversity friendly. So it's an interesting concept, but there isn't biodiversity on the one hand and humankind on the other. I think we need to become aware of the fact that we need to leverage nature, that we are ourselves part of nature, that we are in a, a whole in which we need balance. That is, I think, the essential point. Thank you, Marie Christine. It's time to wrap up our session. Let me begin by thanking all the speakers who uh, helped us uh, explain this ambition to talk about cooperation, nature based solutions, and adaptation to climate change. Because of uh, the impact of uh, climate change, we've seen that in various regions, at various levels, uh, we have uh, flooding, drought, deterioration of resources for drinking water. We have agricultural problems. And of course, we have 
additional uh, pressure, man-made pressure, that mean that we need to look at broader-based solutions if we are to manage water resources better. Also, if we are to better preserve our biodiversity. Well, cooperation is really one of the core businesses that are uh, needed in uh, the management of uh, river basins and uh, catchment areas. Interests may be contradictory with one another, but they must be reconciled if the resource is to be preserved and if uh, waterways are to be preserved. So I'm very happy about the fact that this session today was a, a good uh, form of cooperation between the Rioba and IUCN. I hope that we will have more cooperation between countries, and we had this very interesting cross-border example concerning the Volta River. Now, it's important to use nature-based solutions as an additional, maybe more rapid response uh, to climate change with a view to preserving water resources and biodiversities. But how do we go about accelerating this process? Several of you mentioned the word acceleration. Obviously, we need more science, we need more knowledge, we need more sharing, more technical sharing of solutions. And this is something that we can only uh, agree with. I'd like to say a word about the two main obstacles that have been mentioned. And I'm afraid we have a uh, interference from another language. Uh, speaker is speaking Spanish. I think we have uh, got our wires crossed. I'm afraid somebody has um, crossed the wires here. Era el 1.5% con una institucionalidad que nos ha demostrado que no nos sirve para lograr los objetivos de escala que requerimos a nivel de planeta. Y el GEF ve esto desde una visión de incoherencia política y ve el GEF ve esto como una limitación incluso a la movilización de recursos, porque esta fragmentación mantiene eh, una serie de políticas que contribuyen. I'm afraid we've lost the original speaker. We have uh, interference from another room with somebody speaking a different language. We will resume the translation as soon as we can get the uh, original speaker. Diversidad y contribución al cambio climático. Todos nuestros gobiernos invierten más en destruir la naturaleza que en protegerla. Ese es el bottom line. Y eso es producto de esta institucionalidad fra fragmentada y también es producto de que los decisores políticos tienen información económica que no es completa para tomar decisiones. Ahí es en donde otro proyecto importantísimo que llevaba el Banco Mundial, es muy importante, el proyecto Waves, se tocaba exactamente ese punto de generar información sobre el capital natural para una mejor toma de decisiones. Este es otro tema que yo veo con muchísima atención en el GEF y lo vemos en el contexto del GEF 8 y sobre todo en el contexto del GEF, del GEF 9. Coherencia política, este, eh, ligar con el tema de la fraccion del fraccionamiento institucional y cómo creamos instituciones que trabajen a nivel del paisaje y la movilización eficiente de recursos domésticos son temas que el GEF trabajará eh, focalizado en nuestros programas en Amazonas, en el Congo, en nuestros programas de ciudades sostenibles. Vamos moviéndonos a, hacia un sistema más integrado a través de los programas de impacto y las, y las áreas focales del GEF se van a manejar con muchísima flexibilidad. Anteriormente solo podíamos usar recursos para biodiversidad, para cambio climático, para desertificación. Hoy este, promovemos que los países tengan total flexibilidad para que en sus recursos de los puntos focales puedan hacer proyectos que integren biodiversidad, cambio climático y este, de, eh, eh, conservación de suelos, restauración de suelos de una manera integral. Así que esa es la visión que, que estamos promoviendo. Es producto de las lecciones positivas que, que tenemos en los países amazónicos, 